Good evening, everyone. We're glad you could join us. My name is Brian Harper, and I'm the Director of Communications at DAN. If you don't mind, please post in the chat to let us know where you're tuning in from. As with all of our webinars, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of this one, so please post any questions you have in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on it, so feel free to post your questions as they come to you. Note that if you're watching this on the events page of Dan.org, you won't be able to post questions. So in that case, you can look at the bottom left corner of the video player, click the YouTube logo to go to Dan's YouTube page, and you can post questions in the chat there. A special thanks today to Force E Scuba Centers for reaching out to us to request this important topic. So if you're here as part of the Force E community, special welcome to you. All right. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Robert Sonsini is a Dan medic and Dan examiner who came to the organization in 2019 after a 17 year stint in Las Vegas. While there, Robert worked in emergency services in Southern Nevada and for Cirque du Soleil's O Show. Robert has a degree in paramedicine and is a PADI master instructor as well as a diver medic technician. Thank you, Robert. All right, thank you, Brian. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to this presentation. Uh, as we said to go, uh, get this going, you know, lobster season is undoubtedly a uh, peak event that takes place every year. And during these events, it's unfortunately has been overshadowed by some incidents and fatalities. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So just a couple of disclosures here. I have no personal interest or uh, vested interest in any product shown here. Anything that we have included is just for illustration purposes and any of the Dan products you see will be available for purchase at our website at dan.org. So tonight we're going to take the, a couple different approaches and look at a look back over the incidents for the past 15 years or so. We're going to discuss some ways and how you can prepare for a successful mini season or sport season and then we're going to go over some tips for keeping you, your dive buddies, and your dive team safe for the upcoming lobster season. So any good presentation I give should always start with a little bit of a history lesson here. And if we look back over the years, we'll find that mini season was initially created in 1974 to help ease some tensions between divers and the commercial fishing industry. Uh, commercial operators were allowed to start setting their traps as early as August 1st, and they could start pulling them on August 6th. Well, sport divers felt that this was a little bit of an unfair advantage as that they had to wait until the actual opening day to get out into the water and start catching some lobsters. Originally called sport season and later dubbed mini season, this occurs every year on the last consecutive Wednesday and Thursday of July. And this year it's going to take place uh, the, as scheduled on the last Wednesday and Thursday. And it precedes the regular lobster season uh, by about a week. So this year, regular lobster season will take place on August 6th and run through till March 31st. Based on the estimates, you can see that there's significant interest in this event. We have roughly 50 to 60,000 anticipated divers in 2016 who took place during mini season, and that number is expected to grow this year. In Monroe County, down in the Florida Keys, we will see roughly 30,000 participants uh, taking place in this two-day event. Uh, by estimate from the Fish and Wildlife Commission, there were 376,000 stamps uh, permitting lobster and hunting trapping for this year. Now, this number can include a variety of fishing permits. For example, some combo licenses for military families and other residents, they can buy this permit, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to go out there and take place in hunting. So there could be more permits than there are divers or people taking part in the event, uh, but still that's a significant number. Back in 2003, North Carolina State University looked at the mini season as a whole just to see the type of environmental and economic impact that it could have on the local community. So they found that during mini season, there were 900 times more boats on the reefs and patches during this two day event uh, compared to what they found two weeks, I'm sorry, three weeks later with a significant drop. Uh, it could be great for your local economy, but however, there is a huge ecological uh, impact as well. In 1986, they found that lobster divers were getting out there and actually affecting the population and it was becoming overcapitalized. So they started to implement a trap reduction program in an attempt to stabilize the population. Well, this worked for a time, but then they found due to the number of traps that they could issue, they actually found an increase in commercial and recre I'm sorry, uh, recreational and commercial diving permits were being 
uh, issued. So now that they've done away with the commercial diving permits, uh, it's, they've been grandfathered. We're actually seeing a stable lobster population on the reefs, which helps uh, keep a, a healthy population and help the event going year after year. In 2015, the statistics from the FWC showed that there were roughly 360,000 pounds being pulled out of the water in these two days, uh, and that roughly accounts for 37% of the population uh, for the year. Uh, compared to the overall season harvest of close to a million pounds, um, that's a pretty significant uh, haul. And then commercial divers in the harvest uh, industry pulling from traps, they're bringing up roughly 25,000 pounds per day, and lobster season runs for approximately 239 days, or about eight months. So even though it's small on the commercial side, this two-day event can actually bring up quite a few lobsters. Of course, with this, there's gonna be some benefits to mini season, and we wanna highlight some of those instead of just talking about all the negatives. So lobster takes about two years for it to be able to reach its legal size, um, and it gives the sport divers a chance to grab something that is keepable. Um, so going out for these two days gives you a fair advantage to get into the water and find some bugs without having to worry about commercial traps being in the water uh, that can cause some potential hazards. This is also a great economical impact for the local community as it allows almost $10 million uh, to be invested into your local hotels, your gas stations, your restaurant, and most importantly the dive shops and charter operations. You can see here that this came from the FWC earlier uh, this week the number of stamps that have been issued. So again, we said earlier, 375,000 stamps, and that invests about $10 million into the FWC, which allows for them to be reinvested into protecting the reefs and as well as other fish and wildlife conservation efforts. Uh, and you can see that even though it was a COVID year, that's quite a significant amount of stamps that have been issued. Um, and they saw a steady increase year over year of the number of stamps and permits being issued for saltwater fishing, um, as well as freshwater fishing, as well as game and hunting. Um, so roughly a 9% increase over 2019 to 2020. Uh, so it's a, a pretty significant jump in the numbers, despite us being in the middle of a pandemic. Obviously, with the popularity of the sport and the number of people who are going out onto the reef, we're going to reasonably assume our call volume here at the Dan Medical Services Center is going to increase. We took a look at some of the numbers over the past five years at how many calls versus cases we get into the call center. Now, when I say a call, this means that someone had called the Medical Services Center from Florida and we, we provided them some information. A case means that when the call came in, it, they actually had symptoms or they had an incident or event from the dive in which they were injured and or uh, needed some other form of medical assistance. So we broke it down over a five week time span and we looked at two weeks prior to lobster season, one week prior the week of, and then one and two weeks after lobster season just to see if we had any trends in our numbers. You can see that there is a little bit of an increase leading up to lobster season and then um, at the end of the season it starts to taper back down. Most notably here when we were looking at these numbers uh, we found that 2018, despite having the highest number of calls to our call center and a significant number of cases, we actually had zero fatalities that year um, during the entire lobster season. So that, that speaks volumes to how safe this event can be, um, and the number of calls coming into our call center can also indicate that people are being proactive in their health and safety when gearing up to, to scuba dive. Now, keep in mind that this list here is not all-inclusive. Sometimes uh, we don't get notified on every event, whether it be an incident, decompression sickness, injury, fatality. We can only find this through Google searches, um, our web-based searches based on our uh, research team, as well as any calls that directly come into us. So this may not be an all-inclusive list here. We broke it down a little bit more to see how many calls were coming in on the actual days of lobster season. So this is that Wednesday and Thursday every year. Um, so you can see that some years we had all cases and no inquiries. Some calls, some years we had a mix of calls and cases. Again, 2018 had a significant number of cases, uh, which brought us to nine for the year, but half of that were, was of the calls that we received. So roughly 18 calls, and then nine of those resulted in some type of case being generated for a diver. 
we're going to take a look at some of the fatalities across North America. In North America, we're counting the United States as well as Canada. So in a five-year span between 2004 and 2009, we found that there were 110 fatalities directly related to hunt, uh, hunting and 400 total fatalities during that time span. So the ones that were relating directly to hunting came from drowning. There were five cardiac related issues. There were seven gas embolism issues. Six of the divers were not recovered, so we don't know how to classify them. So they fall into the missing cause category. And then there was one incident involving a boat prop or propeller. Um, and this is research that was done by Dr. Peter Buzzacott, who is uh, one of our past directors of injury prevention here at Dan. Uh, so he provided us this information for this evening. Of those fatalities, we looked at the numbers and what were the contributing causes here. So some of these deaths had more than one factor, so that's why these numbers don't add up to 110, but 92 of these fatalities were diving from a boat. 28 of those, or a little over 25%, were related to solo diving. 13 occurred during night when the lobsters come out of their holes and they stroll across the reef. Um, and they're much easier to find. 20 of these resulted in a gas-related emergency, which could ultimately be a part of a arterial gas embolism. And there was actually a portion of the divers who had no diver training or official certification from any of the agencies. Dr. Buzzacott also did a 10-year study to find out how many fatalities directly come out of Florida during mini season. So we found that of the 51 diver fatalities in Florida over this 10 year span, 22 deaths or 43% of those occurred on these two days of mini season. So mini season are those two days at the end of July plus an additional eight months that lasts from August through March. By comparison, we saw in California, they had 27 deaths during the same time span. Um, now here we can note that California does not have a mini season. Their season starts on September 29th and runs to March 18th, give or take a couple of days, depending on the day of the week. Um, so Florida looks at close to 237 days for their season, where by comparison, California's season is only 168 days or about five months. So Florida season runs a little bit longer. Again, here you can see that there was a notable trend with 2009, and 2008 being the year with the most fatalities with about or with four per year. Some other stats we found going into lobster season uh, for this year, we were looking at newspapers, Google searches, um, and some other sources that we could find online, and we did find a few other fatalities. So this is consistent with what we see of roughly one to two fatalities per year. Uh, in 2016, we saw one fatality involving a 60-year-old male. And then in 2017, there was a 78-year-old male who was snorkeling looking for lobster during mini season. However, uh, he was being towed behind a boat uh, while he was looking down over the reefs and, and the patches. Again, as I mentioned, 2018, great job to the diving community, zero fatalities. And then in 2019, we had a 70-year-old male that had a fatality, and there was a second fatality that year as a result of a propeller injury. And then in 2020, there was another fatality of a male in his 50s, but this was a non-mini season event. Uh, this actually took place in August of that year. So looking at some other incidents that were reported to authorities over the years, they found that uh, there were some incidents between the divers uh, look, fighting over a hunting hole. Um, and we saw some reports of one diver shooting another with a spear gun. There was another report of using a flare gun in an altercation reports of divers throwing rocks at each other from boat to boat. Uh, there were some boat to boat fights there. Um, and then we, there was also some reports of divers being struck by boats. So this shows that it is pretty hectic out there on the water, but with a little bit of intervention and a little bit of, of uh, common sense approach, we can have a good safe season. There are certainly some hazards that tend to show trends in lobster season um, and these can certainly uh, lead to other events and incidents happening. So gas supply, as we saw, we see divers who have issues with their gas. They run out of air or get low on air. They make a rapid ascent to the surface and this can result in a gas embolism. Also, we see that inexperienced divers tend to take to the reefs where they can get caught up in the moment looking for the bugs and they tend to lose focus on what's happening. 
Uh, we can also look at multitasking as being a factor into this uh, because they are focusing on looking for lobsters. They have a gauge in one hand, trying to measure the lobster. They have their catch bag in another hand. If they're night diving, they may have to carry a dive light. Um, and all this multitasking can actually lead to losing our vigilance um, and our 360 awareness and failing to follow our air supply and our dive plans. We also found that there are some divers who only dive two days a year um, and they dive strictly on mini season. So they may not have a history of recent dive activity. Um, their gear could be outdated, not in service, or they could actually uh, have um, just some inexperience going down onto the reef. We have to be vigilant of ghost nets out there and that we aren't run a risk of entanglement. Um, and again, as I previously mentioned, multitasking and some people will like to look inside overhead obstructions, whether it be a reef, uh, a shipwreck or some kind of artificial reef that could actually uh, house some bugs. However, it could become problematic should they become disoriented or lost inside that wreck. So a couple of takeaway points here. We see that because of out-of-air emergencies, drowning obviously is one of the most common causes of death, and that was the leading factor of those 110 fatalities. Cardiac issues was the second most common cause of the death, and hunters who, who, uh, who have inexperience with diving and failing to monitor the gas supply are another leading factor here. And again, that leads to our gas embolism. And then solo diving seems to be a very common in hunting because divers will go out as a team or as a buddy team and they separate on the reef or the patch with hopes that they can maximize their catch in the minimal amount of time. Um, and this can be potentially dangerous if they don't have that buddy nearby to fly an alternate air source or if they don't have proper redundancy in order to, to have a backup air supply to get them safely to the surface. So with that, we can now gonna move into how to prepare for a successful mini season. A Couple of things that you can do, and a lot of this starts at home, uh, and it begins with doing a cursory check of your equipment. We also are gonna look at beginning how to prepare an emergency action plan and talk about some self-awareness and doing a well self-check to make sure that we are physically fit, both, both physically and mentally prepared to go forth and dive this year. So let's review some of the things about our equipment. We wanna make sure that our BCDs like our regulators are serviced at regular intervals, and this is much like our regulator. Set it up, inflate it, spray it with some soapy water, look for leaks, make sure that it holds air, work the inflation and deflation mechanisms to make sure that they work properly, that they're not sticking, and that if you were to use it again, it will actually uh, hold air without causing any problems. You can orally inflate the bladder, make sure that we're comfortable with that. If you have your alternate safe second or your safe second built into your, your regulator instead of an, an octopus, make sure that that is working properly. If there's no free flows or difficulties with that. Activate the quick dump valves. Make sure that those function properly and that they seal after they've been activated, that there's no dust or debris underneath them. And ensure that all your straps are in good working order, that there's no breaks or cracks on them. And you're familiar with the operation of them and how to release them in the event that it's needed. And also look at your equipment too to make sure that uh, it is properly streamlined to minimize entanglements and damaging the reefs or, or the hunting holes. And then let's look at our regulator. So when was that last service? Most regulators have a one to two year surface interval, or service interval I should say. Um, so make sure that we are following the manufacturer's recommendations for that. Take a look at the hoses. If you have the rubber hoses, make sure that they uh, show no signs of dry rot, that the crimps are, are properly attached. All our O-rings are in good connection, so we don't have a risk of uh, O-ring failure. And then if you look at the braided hoses, check them for signs of wear or if there's any flat spots um, that could show the, the deterioration of the lining or the crystals inside. Uh, and get those replaced if you notice any changes or, or damage to them. Are all your connections working properly? Do they breathe well? Are the purge buttons functioning properly? If you have a Venturi knob, does that work properly as well as the variable flow rate? Um, make sure that there's no free flows. And then also check your SPG. Maybe compare it to another SPG or take it to a service center and have them put it on a flow bench to make sure that it's accurate and it shows your remaining air supply properly. And then let's consider our cylinders. When were your cylinders last used? When were they last filled? Some divers will take them right to the shop to have them filled immediately after the dive. Some divers will tend to wait a little bit. 
And if it's been a long time since they've been filled, you may want to consider how they've been stored, whether they've been on their base or if they've been laying down, because laying down could actually cause some corrosion along the sidewall. Um, and then we also want to make sure that our visual inspection as well as the hydros are current and everything is up to date. And then do an analysis of your cylinder. Make sure that the cylinder contains the breathing gas that you know um, that you want to dive with so there's no risk of oxygen toxicity, as well as ensure that the oxygen content of the cylinder remains the same from when it was last filled. Sometimes with steel cylinders we can find that corrosion sets in and the actual O2 content of the cylinder can decrease. And then take a look at your personal equipment. Mask and fins, will they fit properly? Do the straps show signs of good service and good repair? Are they going to break on the dive? If so, you may want to replace those beforehand. Okay, make sure that everything functions properly. How about your exposure protection? Are you adequately protected against the elements, whether you're diving on a reef or perhaps the thermal elements? Make sure that we are safe, warm, and comfortable during the dive. Some of the events we saw over the years involved boats and propellers where divers were getting struck or injured by propellers. So it's a good idea to carry a surface marker buoy or a delayed surface marker buoy with you. So if you get off of the reef or away from the patch, you have something with you to indicate where you are in the water so the boats that are in the area can see you and avoid you. Make sure that we have our lobster gauges because by law you have to have that gauge with you. Your lobster has to be measured in the water um, before you bring it up and back onto the boat. And here remember too that the Tails cannot be separated from the body until you get back onto shore. Okay. The tickle stick that you have, make sure that that's in good repair, that's going to work properly and it'll, and as designed. And then your net and catch bag work as well. Last thing you hate to do is grab a lobster, go to put it in your bag and find out that you have a hole in the bottom and, and that bug gets away. And then by popular demand, we brought back the Dan tag, which is available at our website. And this can actually help identify you not only as a DAN member, but it gives us some information as well. So when we get a call into the Medical Services Center, we can look you up by your member ID and we can have some basic information on you. And whoever the dive master is, your dive buddy can give us information about your medical history, your allergies, and we can use that information if we have to confer with healthcare professionals later and share that information with them. And then take a look at your uh, personal equipment here to make sure that our dives are safe. Every boat or every group of divers should have a first aid kit. These should include some gloves, bandages, keep some vinegar with you to act as a neutralizer against the, the jellyfish and other stinging nematocysts. Check your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like your ibuprofen. Make sure that you that is uh, not expired as well as the aspirin and then check to make sure that we have a tourniquet with us in the event that we need to deploy one of those and practice with the tourniquet so, so you know how to put it on properly. If you're going to be diving with a boat um, and you have an AED on board, now's a good time to give it a good check. Make sure that the battery is properly charged and functioning. Your pads are in their waterproof container and that that container is still sealed. Uh, exposure to air can dry out that conductive gel. And it's a good idea here to keep a razor or a towel with you so you can prep the chest should that AED have to be deployed. And then go ahead and open up your oxygen kit. Are your cylinders full and they're ready to go? Is your unit completely assembled and has it been tested? So all you have to do is open the case, turn the valve, and you can start administering oxygen. Make sure it's completely operational. If you have one of the manually triggered ventilators, test that, turn the O2 on, make sure that emergency shutoff valve works as designed, and then any disposable parts that you have, like the non-rebreather mask or the oral nasal resuscitation mask, those are in good work in order. And of course, have your gloves with you for your own PPE, and is your O2 slate up to date and current with best practices. And then with any injured diver, we need to consider shock management. So an injured diver can go into shock to make sure that we can adequately prepare that. Blankets and having a, a bottle of water for them to sip are good ideas. Um, to help manage that shock and maintain their well-being until you can get them to the shore or to uh, EMS. Okay. And now let's talk about the diver. You know, what was your recent diving experience? Have you been in the water recently? This might be a good time to talk with your local dive shop and perhaps get a refresher done. Okay, because we, as we mentioned earlier, some divers only dive once or twice a year. Um, for others, are you comfortable diving in these conditions? If, have you been diving in salt water before? Are you comfortable diving in 
reefs looking for, for small critters and, and small lobsters that could be hiding in holes. Okay. What about your CPR first aid in O2? Are those current? Uh, we recommend to get those updated every two years. And then are you comfortable diving at night? Um, is your buoyancy control uh, adequate? Are you good with handling a light while handling your, your lobster bag, while handling your gauge? These are all things that we should practice on a regular basis before taking to the water leading up to this. So well-practiced uh, dive skills will help make your dive go a lot easier. And then lastly, what about you? Are you physically and mentally prepared for the dive? Uh, if you are not 100% well, whether that be physically due to illness or injury, we would recommend that you postpone the dive until you are, um, as well as any type of, of mental mental conditions, something could be weighing on your mind, whether it be illness, family, financial, any host of reasons, all of those could distract us from our dive and distract from our safety. So you didn't know there was going to be a test tonight, but here's a good opportunity to take a look at one of the most common questions we get here on the medical information line. Um, and what I'd like you to do is take a moment and go ahead and put your answer into the comments, and then we're going to come back to this question uh, in just a couple of minutes. So common question we get is, I've recently been prescribed a new medication by my physician. What research do you have on this drug and diving? So the answers here are we have no information. We have ample information. Tell us the medication and the dose. There are no implications on medications and diving. Or we are not concerned about the medication. We're concerned about why you were prescribed the medication itself. But we'll come back to that here. Just go ahead and put your answer into the comment section and Brian's monitoring that. So during the pandemic, we found an opportunity here to take a look at the divers and their opportunities to come up with a lifelong schedule for fitness to dive. Our, our well-being, our health come, should play into our decision to dive, whether or not we're looking at diving uh, locally or diving internationally. So this chart here shows what every diver should look at when determining to dive. And if you follow it from the top, it works a little bit like a flow chart where we have our entry level diver who's going to consider diving and they have to fill out the typical RSTC and UHMS medical statement. If they have any positive answers there, we want to refer them to a physician to determine their fitness to dive and make sure that they are, are okay in this environment. So, uh, on this questionnaire, we ask, has there been anything that changed to your mental or, or physical health in the past couple of years? Have you started taking new medications? When was your last physical? Are there risk factors that we need to consider? Uh, and you can see here that we look at someone who's 45 years or older, we should be looking at this form at least once a year and perhaps undergoing a complete fitness to dive evaluation every five years. And that RSTC UHMS form that's handed out by every dive shop to an entry-level student suffices for our fitness to dive. And if you take this to your physician and the physician has questions about it, we're more than willing to talk to your physician and help them understand your health, your well-being, and your fitness to dive. So there were two notable events here in 2013 in which a diver in West Palm Beach who was 19 years old was taking part in some commercial diving activity uh, and he uh, became injured, was taken to a local hospital, and was found to be suffering from a heart attack. Uh, and again, the emphasis there was on this was a 19-year-old dive professional as well as a commercial fisherman. And then in the Keys that same year, we found that there was a 52-year-old diver who was uh, from Pennsylvania, and while he was diving, he suffered from sudden cardiac arrest. And during the autopsy, they found that he had an extensive bout of coronary artery disease, and that was a contributing factor leading up to his death. So it's a good idea to look at these forms and review them regularly with your physician to make sure that we are safe and adequate to dive. So the backside of this form, and it's available by contacting us, we'd be able to share it with you so you can have it as a reference copy. All you have to do is contact us in the medicine department. We'd be happy to email this to you. Candidates who are going for entry-level diving, again, they're going to fill out the, the medical questionnaire. Any healthy diver should take a look at this form annually. And again, using that medical questionnaire is a great resource. Okay. An asymptomatic diver, meaning you don't show any symptoms, but you have a couple of risk factors, including smoking or vaping, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, or a family history of heart disease or a lack of exercise. Those are heart-contributing uh, factors that can lead to an injury while diving. 
So again, we should look at our doctor, talk with them, and make sure that we have a good exercise tolerance and a good healthy heart to take on diving activity. Diving is actually the only activity that we participate in that not only changes us physically, but our physiology changes as well. There's certain processes in physics that will take place and they can affect us when we get into the water, into this alien environment. And then if we have pre-existing conditions or take medications, again, this is where we want to start talking with our doctor to determine our overall fitness to dive. So this is the new RSTC and UHMS medical statement and RSTC's Recreational Scuba Training Council, UHMS Underseen Hyperbaric Medis Medical Society. They revamped this form. Now in contrast to the previous version, they started looking at some evidence-based medicine here to kind of wean out the number of doctor, uh, divers that have to go see their doctor. So it's using evidence-based, it's a little bit more user-friendly, um, and there's a side A and a side B to this to help them identify what is a mild, moderate, severe, or absolute contraindication to scuba diving. Um, so we can also use this form to identify informed divers who be at, may be at a significant risk um, that they should secure a medical evaluation before they decide to get into the water. And for those of you that are dive professionals in the audience, we recommend that you take a look at this form at a more frequent basis, because we, we should ask ourselves that if I anticipate my student to be able to meet these criteria, I should be able to meet the same criteria as well and be considered fit to dive at the same level my, my student or those that I'm tasked with their safety should be able to meet. Um, so with this schedule and fitness to dive, consider the top five uh, risks uh, put out by the CDC on what can be leading deaths or leading illnesses in, in society. Cardiovascular health is obviously the biggest one of all followed by asthma and respiratory concerns, a inability to exercise or poor exercise tolerance um, is also a significant risk here. Our overall medical history, any medications we are taking, and then ultimately our age. So as we continue to age, we should also consider increasing our, uh, the, the time that we look at this form. And also when we're diving, we need to consider any additional uh, gear that we're carrying. So the equipment that I'm going to put on, the gear, the weight, um, sometimes we tend to weight ourselves a little more than normal scuba diving just because we want to make sure that we can stay down on the bottom, but then we have to offset that uh, when we come back up to the surface, not to mention the weight of our catch can also play a factor in our buoyancy. And then consider here the dive environment that you're in as well. So coming back to this question here, uh, we were talking about medications and diving and our overall uh, well-being. So we asked, I have just recently been prescribed a new medication by my physician. What research do you have on this drug and scuba diving? So, Brian, do we have answers? We have a correct answer, in fact. Uh, Excellent. Dive Bunny has posted in the chat, and correct me if I'm wrong, the answer is D. Yeah, so All great right. job there, Dive Bunny. Our correct answer here is D. So if you remember looking at that medical questionnaire, one of the questions says, do I take any prescription medications with the exception of anti-malarial or any type of birth control? So the, the answer here is, uh, if I say yes to this question, I take prescription medications, I have to see my physician. And again, we get this question a lot where they ask, I have this medication, how does it affect my diving? We don't really have a huge concern over the amount of medication or what medications you're taking. It's the actual condition that you're taking the medication for. So if you're taking this medication to treat your high blood pressure, what is that effect of the medication and how is it going to affect your body and your ability to dive safely? Um, very few medications have actually been tested in a hyperbaric environment and we have very little evidence to show that there are significant risks when taking the host of medications available um, and that we want to make sure that the effect of the medication isn't going to affect your safety. So great job there, Dive Bunny, on that answer. So keep that, me that medical questionnaire in mind going forward. If you answer yes to any of those, maybe postpone diving. Remember, you have eight months in Florida to make sure that we can go off and dive uh, to catch those lobster. So make sure that we are both physically fit and mentally prepared to go off and do those dives. So our team here has put together this infographic, which is available on our website. 
in which you can, can download, and we have some links coming up where you can find this information at the end of the presentation on how to make this season uh, injury-free and fatality-free. We're also gonna have our research team out in Florida this year. Um, they're gonna be working with some dive shops and operations up in the West Palm Beach area, uh, where our research team is gonna be monitoring the hydration status of divers and assessing their cognition and how you perform during and after diving activities. So they're going to be doing some studies where uh, following a dive, they're gonna do a urinalysis and they're gonna test the, the lab values on that urinalysis and then give the diver an iPad in which they have to perform a battery of tests. These tests can include uh, recognition. Uh, they can also include your ability to respond to a, a changing number in a timely manner. It's gonna assess your short time, term memory and memory recall, as well as your ability to track a pattern on a screen and assess your ability to correctly identify and pinpoint uh, this object. That blue square will move around and get smaller every time you tap it. Uh, I've done these tests, it's quite interesting, um, and it can be challenging when you're not dehydrated and laden with nitrogen. So um, it'll be interesting to see the results following these these uh, tests over the next couple of days. So here it is, Florida. We've got one state, 360,000 divers, roughly 30 to 50,000 people taking part over two days. And again here, bring the home to take home message here, 20 mini season fatalities over the past 10 years. Roughly 43% of all fatalities that have occurred in Florida are a result of these two days. So ways that you can help avoid becoming a statistic, we wanna check our air often and keep that buddy close by so you have a source of redundancy. Also make sure that you know your limits, both your air supply, your exercise tolerance, as well as your depth limits and your ability to manage narcosis um, and monitor your air supply again closely here and then create a, a dive plan and then dive that plan. And if you have to abort the dive, there's never any shame in thumbing the dive and going back later for, for the hunt. In the event of an incident, remember that step one here is that we wanna activate EMS um, and, and or Coast Guard. Now keep in mind here that sometimes during a event where there's a lot of people with cell phones, the towers may become congested and that phone call may not go through. Um, so always have a backup plan, whether this is going to be in the form of a satellite phone or local marine band radio so you can get a hold of either shore patrol or the Coast Guard to, to get assistance. And then our next step would be is to notify us via the emergency hotline. The number's there, it's staffed 24 seven by our team of medics and physicians, and we're ready to take your call should you need us. So again, on average, two diver fatalities each year. And a lot of times we find that it's because divers have pushed their limits, because um, they're trying to get those limits within 48 hours, and they have restricted bag limits, and they wanna make sure that they can take the maximum haul. Hunters have been more likely to run low on air or out of air, um, than non-hunters, which can result in a arterial gas embolism. And then we can prevent this by doing adequate preparation and making sure that we have a good plan when getting ready to get into the water. Some other tips for making this a safe season, follow your local and CDC guidance regarding proper precautions for diving and being outdoors during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Make sure that we have our hunting uh, and licensing stamps in place and we're ready to, to show them if upon request. Uh, stick within your limits, making sure that your catch is both uh, within the, the regulations as well as of proper size. Um, and make sure you know where you are and avoid marine protected areas uh, where hunting may be prohibited. And also focal, uh, follow local dive flag laws and regulations. Again, as we threw some incidents involving boaters, um, and divers come in contact with each other, so make sure that we carry an SMB with us for surface uh, safety, and also become familiar with how to deploy that. Um, the, the time we don't wanna deploy it for the first time is when we actually need it. So practice that as part of that pre-dive safety check on how are you going to deploy this. Um, and then always dive with a buddy. Um, it makes it more fun, as well as it makes it more safe. Take a look at the diving medical questionnaire. If you answer yes, or if you have questions about it, see a physician. Again, we have eight months to go forth and catch these lobsters, so there's really no rush to get into the water. Again, the, the mantra, plan your dive, dive the plan. Make sure that we're familiar with it and everybody else is familiar with the plan. 
it's a good idea here to file a copy with someone who's going to be ashore or not going on the trip, so that way they can alert authorities um, or the local community of an overdue boat or missing divers. Um, choose dive sites that match your training and your experience as well as your fitness level, and then practice your emergency procedures before getting into the water, which can include a weight drop, oral inflation, and practice those emergency swimming ascents before they're actually needed. Developing an emergency action plan is also a great idea and make sure that we are, are safe to go out into the water and we know how to respond to an emergency. Uh, if you are diving by boat, some people have their home marina that they launch from and dive in certain areas, but sometimes that marina may be, not be the closest one. So know where your closest marina is to your dive site and you can access that marina in case of an emergency. Again here, make sure you know how to access local emergency services, have a backup plan in case the cell phone towers are, are overcrowded and you can't get through. Um, and then also note here the location of the nearest emergency room. Another common call we get is, where's the nearest hyperbaric chamber? Well, diving injuries actually mimic a lot of other injuries and illnesses, so anytime a diver comes up with suspected decompression sickness or gas embolism, we recommend that diver go to the nearest medical facility. What we want to avoid is that diver going to a hyperbaric chamber that may be closed, not properly staffed, or they could be treating another diver or another patient for wound care, and it's not immediately available. And that diver actually has to be cleared through an emergency room first before they can go to the hyperbaric chamber. So often, going to the emergency room is your best bet because they have imaging capabilities, they have an unlimited supply of oxygen, as well as IV fluids in which they can start stabilizing and identifying what is wrong with the injured diver um, and then make that proper coordination of care to get them to the hyperbaric chamber if it's indicated. Okay. Uh, as far as the diver goes, if when you're confronted with an injured diver, activate your emergency action plan, get your resources coming to you or be on your way to meet local EMS, check the diver, ensure that their airway breathing and circulation is intact. If needed, start CPR. Um, and then put the diver onto that oxygen. Again, high concentration of oxygen, 15 liters per minute on a non-rebreather mask, or if you have a demand valve or a manually triggered ventilator, activate that. Remember to test it before giving it to the injured diver to make sure that it works and that safety mechanism works on the MTV. Okay. Put the diver into a position of comfort and then start to the nearest shore, pier, marina, or launch, or send somebody to meet EMS so they can direct you direct, direct, uh, you can direct them directly to the injured diver if you're diving from a shore or beach location. Also in your emergency action plan, try to get your dive profiles of the injured diver because this data can be helpful when uh, trying to determine if this is decompression sickness, a gas symbolism, or possibly some other underlying circumstance that the diver was unaware of. Uh, note any unusual events, including rapid ascents, lost gear, out of air situations. Secure the dive equipment for inspection. Make sure that it's not tampered with, that everything is left in a position in which it came to the surface. So avoid hit and purge buttons. Avoid um, interfering with the mechanisms to see if it, they work properly. Leave that for the authorities to do their inspections. Um, assist in transferring the diver to EMS. Give them those dive profiles. Give them their DAN ID number so they can connect with us and we can provide the information that we have. Uh, and then also cooperate with any authorities as part of an investigation. And then give us a call. Contact us on the emergency hotline. You can provide the diver name and member number if applicable and available. Um, and they don't have to be a member to call or you don't have to be a member to call us. We are here to help all divers regardless of membership. Uh, just give us a call and we can start collecting that information. And that also allows us to reach out to the diver later in case we have to follow up for any assistance or potential need to transport them to another facility or maybe even assist them with their travel plans to get them back home. Um, and then you can reach out to us on our website as well at dan.org um, to our research team and file the report on the diving incident reporting system. So the DRRS or the diving incident reporting system is actually uh, helpful in us tracking the incidents and events that occur in the diving community, not just lobster season, but all year long. So we can see trends in the industry and we can actually try to come up with ways to prevent further injuries and accidents. These QR codes are going to be available for you to, to look at. You can go to our website at dan.org and look at our page that we have designed for lobster safety hunting and tips. 
Uh, this webinar will be available for you to view at a later date if you want to go back and look at the slides or look at some additional information. Um, that'll be available to view as well as a host of other information and videos um, that have been assembled just for this event. Those are available for your, your viewing. And again, this is available free of charge to the public. You can just go to dan.org and look at this information without having to be a member, though we strongly encourage membership. Again, here's the diving incident report system. Uh, this was around for a while. It, it was revamped, redesigned, and it's now active again. So we're encouraging all divers who experience a incident, accident, or even a near miss, log on and report your incident to us. It, it's confidential. We're, we're not going to uh, reach out and, and question why and how. Okay? It just gives us an idea to the trends in the community as to what's happening and we can come up with ideas on how to uh, correct these problems uh, and prevent fatalities and injuries. Um, so again, here you can go to, the, to our website, dan.org, under research, and you can find uh, the link to the DIRS. And then lastly here, any of the products that you can see, to, uh, see here for a safe dive, you can purchase an oxygen unit, you can purchase a first aid kit, you can purchase equipment for your uh, diving emergency medical provider course or your diving first aid for professional divers course here. Um, you can get products on how to, to learn how to take our classes to prevent dive accidents and support an injured diver. Um, all that information is available on our website and the products are available at our store at dan.org as well. Uh, and with that, I'll give it back to Brian. All right. And go from there. Thanks, Robert. Uh, and thank you all for being with us. Um, as Robert said, a special thanks to Dan members without whom this sort of educational outreach would not be possible. And uh, thanks again to Force E Scuba Center. So let's go to the questions. All right, first one here. Uh, does Dan have any resources for creating an EAP, Emergency Action Plan? Yeah, so we do have an emergency action plan slate available uh, through our training programs, and, and that is part of the training uh, of the program. They help you develop an EAP. Um, but you can also reach out to us in the medicine department and share with us what you need, and we can provide you some information on how to develop and create an emergency action plan. And our risk mitigation team also has some tools and resources available for you as well to help create your plan um, and make your dives safer. Mm -hmm. um, so you can reach out to risk mitigation at dan.org or give us a call at the medical information line and we'd be happy to assist. Absolutely, and I'll add as well, <coughs> in addition to reaching out to risk mitigation uh, at riskmitigation.dan.org, uh, we are also in the process of uh, creating an e-learning course uh, about creating an emergency action plan. Um, we have a tool that is, uh, will be available very soon if not already. So keep an eye on dan.org for that. All right, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. Um, next question. Uh, my doctor cleared me to dive in January 2021. Uh, I was just put on a new medication two weeks ago. Do I have to get a new clearance from my doctor before I go dive? Yeah, that's a great question. We get that a lot because people believe that that medical questionnaire, when they get it signed out, is good for 12 months. Um, but you know, that's only really good for the day that it is signed. Any type of event that uh, comes down the pike may warrant us going to get a new medical statement filled out. Um, so what we should do is, first of all, we, we don't recommend diving with any medication uh, that you just started taking for a minimum of 30 days. That way you can understand what the side effect of that medication is and how it's going to affect you and your diving. Um, and then talk to your di doctor, let them know that you are a diver and see if they uh, are, your condition is consistent with diving with this new medication. And again, if they have questions, we're happy to talk to your doctor. All, they don't need an appointment. They can give us a call during business hours on the information line. We're happy to confer with them and provide any information they need. All right. Thanks for that, Robert. A uh, couple more questions coming mm -hmm. in. Uh, do you offer insurance for scuba gear? And so, I can take that one. Or you okay, can. go ahead. No, uh, we do. Uh, if you go to uh, dan.org slash membership hyphen insurance equipment hyphen insurance. And there you can find the... Uh, equipment insurance options that Dan does offer. Thanks for that one. Um, and then the next question, what are the most important points, uh, Robert, that dive buddies should discuss before entering the water for many seasons? That's a good one. So first of all, do you know your dive buddy? Um, if this is somebody new that you've teamed up with, discuss 
their experience, their level of training, conditions that they've been diving in, and are they comfortable in diving in these present conditions. Also discuss the plan. Where are you going to go? How are you going to do it? What's your maximum depth going to be? What's your bottom time going to be? Also, something that gets overlooked a lot is hand signals. I, I see whenever I work with, with students and new divers um, that they've learned hand signals from other instructors or other dive shops. Uh, it, it's not a universal language. So discuss the hand signals to understand what this means. If I give a signal, you can respond appropriately without me flashing back a, a question mark and not knowing. Um, so those are the three big, big points um, going into a dive. So make sure that you know the plan, um, you're sticking within the experience, and you know what those hand signals mean underwater. All right, great. Thanks for that. Uh, another good question here. Uh, what are some classes I can take to have a successful mini? Um, so there are some programs out there. You could do a distinctive specialty for underwater hunting. There are some agencies that have those types of classes available. And then look at the environment that you're going to be diving in. Will it be beneficial for uh, nitrox, if you're going to be in certain environments where nitrox can be a benefit for you? And nitrox is a wonderful gas that you can breathe, not only to help extend your no decompression limits, but you can actually use it to pad your overall safety by diving on nitrox while leaving your computer set to air. It's just going to add a little bit of extra conservatism. Taking a night diver class, because Again, the bugs come out of their hunting holes at night and make sure you're following local regulations because there are some areas that don't allow uh, lobster hunting at night. A deep diver specialty class, if you're gonna be diving down uh, at significant depths to, to help hunt or look for not just lobsters, let's talk about scallops, let's talk about uh, flounder, let's look at some other crustaceans. All of these can be beneficial uh, for, uh, tools can be beneficial when taking these these uh, events on and learning how to dive properly. These classes are all helpful. So diving at deep, night, nitrox, buoyancy control, underwater hunting. You know, I'm all about education. Any class you can get, it's a good class. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and as we saw from some of those numbers uh, in your presentation, a scuba course, a, an open water certification is a yes. great place <laughs> Let's for start there. to start. <laughs> and, and a refresher there. course, if you haven't dived in a yeah. year or more, uh, or even less, but, and you feel like you'd like to, a refresher course is never a bad idea. Refreshers are always good. All right, let's see what else we have. Um, Robert, is dehydration a factor? Yeah, so that's gonna be one of the things that uh, our research team is looking at while they're down in Florida. They're gonna assess, not only does it impair their cognition and their ability to function, um, but they're gonna put a little bit of uh, work into determining whether or not it is a factor in DCS. So there are many factors that go into decompression sickness. We can sit here and, and come up with a list of 20 different factors. On that list is going to be dehydration. At one point there was a, a thought that dehydration is the leading cause, but that seems to have taken a foothold and it's a common misconception that we get calls on when, it, when somebody says, I feel like I've been bent and I was dehydrated and I think that that's a cause. Well, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So um, the, the answer here is we don't 100% fully understand it. Um, there's some more research to be done on it, but it is one of many factors, not a sole factor. Great. Uh, another question here in the chat. Uh, does Dan offer first aid classes to prepare for emergency? Yes, yeah, so you can reach out to our training department. Uh, we do have a full suite of seven classes in which you can take to uh, broaden your education and learn how to take care of an injured diver. It includes basic first aid, oxygen administration for an injured diver. It also includes marine life injuries, neurological assessment, as well as a healthcare provider option for those who are nurses, doctors, first responders who need to renew. Um, they can renew their healthcare provider certifications through us as well. Yes, and those courses are great for treating injuries outside of diving environments as well. So don't hesitate to look into some of Dan's first aid course offerings at dan.org or send an email to our training department at oxygen at dan.org. Learn about the courses we offer, not just for divers, but to anybody who wants to be able to help their friends and loved ones uh, in the event of an emergency. All right, what else have we got? Um, can you explain, Robert, the different flags a boater should use during many what they see? Yeah, so two common flags. We have the conventional red and white flag, red background with a white stripe, um, and that flag is the universal scuba flag. But sometimes a lot of boaters may not understand that. 
Um, some of them may understand the alpha flag, which is the blue square with uh, two white triangles off to the side. Um, so those are the two common flags. Uh, some dive boats will fly just one, some fly both. Um, so make sure that they are of proper size of, your, of uh, local regulations to make sure that you're complying. Um, bigger is always better, so boats in the area and operators know that there are divers in the water. Um, I think that's uh, the end of the questions we have. Um, do you have anything else to add? No. I, all right. I, all I don't think I do either. Right. So one more time, thanks to everyone for attending. Thanks to the Dan members for your support. And we look forward to seeing you next month for our uh, third Thursday of the month webinar. Um, we'll be back at our usual 7 p.m. time. Thank you all, and I hope you have a safe and successful lobster mini season. You guys, happy diving.